Part two, Acts chapter three, go there in your Bible. Let's build upon this that we started last week. Um, In verse one, it says, I'm reading from the message Bible. One day at three o'clock in the afternoon, Peter and John were on their way to the temple for a prayer meeting at the same time. Again, this is Acts chapter three, verse one. There was a man crippled from birth. Everyone say from birth. And so he was being carried up every day. He was set down at the temple gate, the one named beautiful to beg from those going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for a handout. Peter with John at his side, looked him straight in the eye and said, look here. He looked up expecting to get something from them. Peter said, I don't have a nickel to my name, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. He grabbed him by the right hand, pulled him up. And in an instant, his feet and his ankles became firm. Say in an instant. He jumped to his feet and walked. The men went into the temple with them, walking back and forth, dancing and praising God. Everybody there saw him walking around and praising God. They recognized him as the one who sat begging at the temple's gate, beautiful, and rubbing their eyes, astonished, scarcely believing what they were seeing. So if you're taking notes, you might wanna write down from birth versus in an instant, because those are the two, um, those are the two time frames with which we see in this this particular um, passage. So we see from birth and then we see things absolutely changing in an instant. Now, um, what I want to note before we, before we move on in um, the very beginning of this, it says every day he was set down at the temple every day. Could you write this statement down? Your days follow your perspective. You know, maybe there's not been any progress in your life and your days are either the same or getting worse because your more light isn't coming. And again, it, it's not about the light coming. It's about you receiving the light. Hosea 4, 6 talks about people who are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, but it's not just that they didn't know, but it's that they rejected knowledge. You know, brother Keith had said that over and over, like in his heart, he thought, well, if I can just get people the truth, but the reality was that wasn't enough. That was only 50% of the effort they needed to accept the truth. And so ultimately it's twofold. It's, it's not just that you're positioned to hear, but you're making a decision to accept it. And so in uh, Matthew chapter, chapter six, verse nine in the Lord's prayer. I really like this. It says in this manner, therefore we pray our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, our daily bread. There is a supply for you every single day, but you have to position yourself there because if you keep doing, and we've, we've told young people, we've told interns, uh, you know, you've heard me say it. Um, if he doesn't have your days, he doesn't have your life. And so every single day, there's, 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 there's an opportunity for you because what we're talking about is we're talking about moving from, from these strongholds or these circumstances that have existed in our lives for a long period of time or in the lives of people that we're leading. We wanna move from these things that have, ha- that have had people bound to these instantaneous places of freedom. And, and in order for that to happen, we've gotta have, a, we've got to have a mind renewal there there was a lot that was going on in this scenario that we cannot see and so we we know from scripture as we gather these things together and these truths together that we can have these same things working in our life because again in um, mark chapter 5 remember 25 through 36 or 26 there was a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years she had suffered many things from many physicians she had spent all that she had she was no better but rather grew worse and so ultimately she was uh, miraculously healed, but this was an effort of her own faith. But then in Luke 13, remember we looked at the woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was bent over. She could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw to her, he called to her. He called her to him and said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. And we said, this was a working of miracles, which um, Pastor Dean was talking to me about this just a couple of days ago. 
you know, miracles are as the spirit will. So those are not a hundred percent at our disposal. Miracles are not a hundred percent at our disposal, which is why you want to be really, really wise and, and really mature in your verbiage. You know, we're believing God for a miracle. You know, what we want to believe God for is that people will take the word and work the word because that always works. That works a hundred percent of the time. But as far as miracles, those are as the spirit wills. And so we, we don't, we don't always even know how those things came together. You know, if we're reading in the book of Acts, um, I believe it was this past, maybe over the weekend, it was either Friday or Saturday when Paul laid his hands on a man and, 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 and Paul knew something, but he knew it by the spirit. He knew something about that man. And so those are good things. And we want to mature in those things, but it's always word first and then spirit. So in your leadership, you always emphasize the word in your own life, your relationship with the word, and you point people that you're leading to the word. The word always comes first. If you, if you emphasize spirit first, you get off into fanaticism and emotionalism. And so you can't do that. You focus on the word first. And so we see though, what we're, what we're illustrating, regardless of, of how it was, how it was administered, the reality is supernatural things can happen in an instant, especially against those conditions that have existed for a really long time. So this woman had been boat over for 18 years in John 9, 1. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Um, in verse four of that same chapter, he said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground. He made clay of saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam and which is translated sent. And so he went and washed and he came back seeing. So his was a little bit longer of a process. It wasn't immediately. He went uh, as far as he would have had to go to that, that pool. He came back, he was healed. And so ultimately it doesn't matter how long, this is what we want to write down um, from last week. It doesn't matter how long things have been this way. It does not matter. It does not matter. And as leaders, we have to look at time correctly because ultimately the enemy would love to infuse fear and doubt into your perspective as it pertains to how long things have been the way that they've been. And in many cases, what we do is we just, um, maybe we, we limit our effort Maybe we don't move forward with the same intensity because we get, we get used to the condition. We get used to getting the prescription. We get used to how we've thought and how we've lived. And when you start accepting less than God's plan for your life in one area, you'll begin to accept it in other areas. You, like, I mean, if you've already decided and, and said, this is as far as I'm going as it pertains to my efforts and my pursuits. And so number two, as leaders, it's your job. Remember we said to tell people where to look. It's your job to tell people where to look. Peter um, spoke to the, the blind man at the, uh, the lame man at the gate beautiful, and he said, look up. And so we talked a little bit about what that looked like last week, and we wanna move into that in a little bit of a different way today. Um, so when you tell people to look up, um, maybe make note of this, you're in direct competition with the enemy at this point. When you tell people to look up, as a leader, you're in direct competition with the enemy at that point. So I just wrote down for myself, beware things could get ugly. Beware things could get ugly. Because the, ult the ultimate thing that we know is according to Ephesians 6, 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So it was the enemy's design to steal from this man. That was his work. So when you go up against his work in the earth, he's, he's gonna, he's not gonna take that like, oh, okay, no big deal. He's already been defeated and he knows his fate and he's still relentlessly in pursuit of any opportunity he can to destroy people's lives. In second Corinthians chapter four, I'm reading one through four in the message. It says, since God, 
as so generally let us in on what he's doing, we're not about to throw up our hands. Now it's important because let me just tell you this. We know second Corinthians four, four says that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of them um, from, from receiving the truth. And let me read it exactly in the, the King James, cause we're most familiar with it. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them, which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God should shine onto them them. Now, what's important for us to, we say that all the time. We pull that verse out of context, which is good. It can stand alone. It, it's got a lot of truth in it, but I think it's important how we read it and that we read it in context. And we understand that first Corinthians was Paul's letter to the church. And it was infused with a lot of correction. There were a lot of things that Paul was having to address in first Corinthians. And then in second Corinthians, he just went ahead and started discussing um, how it was going to unfold in in, in light of like their relationship with him now that he had to basically bring these things to light. And so what's neat to notice about this verse is even though it does stand alone and it does talk about what the enemy's work is in people's lives, he was sharing it in the context of his work in their lives. Right. And so he's saying in advance, like, I know that this is the enemy's agenda, but, but this is the thing since God has been so generous, generously letting us in on what he's doing, we're not going to throw up our hands and walk off the job. He wouldn't say that if there weren't those moments where he felt like, you know what, yeah, right. seriously, yeah. do whatever you want, yeah. <laughs> do whatever you want. Right. There were obviously those moments, but but where? Do, why did those moments present themselves? And again, I'm talking to you as though you want to not only lead yourself, but you want to be a leader and you want to recognize how that's gonna unfold because being a leader is not just what you say. It's how you think, it's what you do, and it's your endurance. It's your longevity. And so he says, I'm not about to throw up my hands. Uh, uh, let me say it this way. It's your consistency. It's your consistency. Uh, uh, not just your endurance, not just enduring for the long haul, but being consistent. Like you're not going to throw up your hands and be like, you know what? I'm done being a parent, but you have to be consistent in that you cannot be inconsistent, right? And so it says, uh, we're not gonna walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. We refuse to wear masks and play games. He's talking to leader, he's talking about himself. He's talking about him and the other apostles. Listen, we're not wearing masks and we're not playing games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. We don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display. Why? So that those who want to see it can judge in and of themselves. Because if our message is obscure to anyone, it's not because we're holding back in any way. No, it's because these other people are looking or going the wrong way and refuse to give it serious attention. Do you hear that? All they have eyes for is fashionable God of darkness. They think he can give them what they want and they won't have to bother believing the truth they can't see. They're stone blind to the day spring night brightness of the message that shines with Christ, who gives us the best picture of God will ever get. The word um, blind actually means obscure, but I want you to write this definition down of obscure. It means not clearly understood. Obscure means not clearly understood. Ambiguous, it means vague and it means faint. Now Paul's saying, listen, we're not quitting. We're not giving up. We're going all out as it pertains to truth. We're gonna tell the truth. We're gonna live the truth. We're gonna be full on in the light. But even then, even then, right? Even then, they're not being serious. They're choosing the God of this world they're not giving it serious attention and they're stone blind to the lightness of the message. Now, when, when we're talking about not clearly understood or ambiguous, vague or faint, as it pertains to your eyesight, think about the presence of a cataract. We're familiar with that and the hardness of that, that, that deposit that obscures your vision. But the vision is obscured as a result of this hard deposit. Right? So, so I, I said it this way, if your heart is hard, your perspective will be wrong. 
blind blindness, the enemy's ability to work in your, your life because the enemy can't do anything in your life that you won't let him. He can't blind your eyes from the truth once you've accepted the spirit of truth. Now we're not talking about unbelievers. We're not talking about unbelievers. That's why we pray that the ministering spirits will, will go before them, that will draw them, you know, unsaved loved ones, unsaved coworkers, but you just keep being the light in front of them, right? But I'm talking to believers as you're leading your children, as you're being exa an example in the local church, when people don't see what's really going on and they, 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 they can't really see truth, your eyes or your perspective are connected to your heart. They're connected there. So if he's got you blinded, it's because there's a hardness in your heart that you've entertained, that you've yielded to. And so if I can't see it, if I keep missing it, then I've got to look at my heart because my heart and my eyesight, as it pertains to the things of God, they go together. In Hebrews chapter three, verse 13, it says, I exhort excuse me, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So there's two reasons that we can make note of today that hardness enters into our heart. Number one is because of sin. Sin will make you hard. Sin will make you hard. And then um, number two, in Mark chapter four, 16 through 17, it says, these likewise are stone on stony ground who when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves. So they endure just for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So number two, we can be hard because of offense, because of trouble or persecution. And so again, as we're looking at, at leaders, it, it, it's important that the people that we're leading know what to do. Because sin is anything, like when you know to do it and you don't do it, that's sin. So for example, in our household, you know, sin might've been called different than it was in other believers' households, right? Because we were taught and we were raised and we were trained in as much of, of, of absolute submission to this, we accepted a standard. That's why it's so important. You've heard us talk about that year after year and deep, like have a family creed, like know as a family what we believe and put that in writing. I knew what my parents believed about X, Y, Z, and I made a decision from an early age out of my love and out of my respect for the life that they lived and the consistency with which they demonstrated integrity. I knew I'm gonna believe what they believe. I'm gonna believe what mom and dad believe about this. And, and so that's why it's so important in a business, in a company, you know, if you're a manager, these things have to be in writing, so to speak. People have to know because the enemy and, 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 and because we are in this natural world, your flesh is always looking for an angle. It's always looking for a loophole. It's always looking for a misunderstanding, right? In which to excuse itself, from doing all that it knows to do. So, so when you present the standard or when you and your household say, okay, this is sin, this is sin, then you have a basis to measure that by and just know that when they don't do that, when we don't do that, when we don't do what we know to do, that's gonna cause hardness in our heart which is gonna affect our perspective. The enemy has an opportunity to obscure truth in our lives. When we don't endure, when we allow ourselves to be offended, which was number two. Um, and, and really, this keeps you from, from looking up. When you tell people the truth, have you ever been, been, been disciplining a child or a young person, or even an old person, and you tell them, look at me, and they don't wanna look at you? Yeah. Right. They don't wanna look at you that's so demonic, yeah. right? They don't want to look at you. Write a couple of these things down. You don't want to. People have a hard time looking up or accepting the truth. Why? Number one, because they're familiar. They're familiar, they're casual. It's important that you position the people that are your voices of truth in a place of honor, whether you're around them or not whether you're just thinking about them, they're not the same. Yes, that's right. 
they're not the same. And that's not to put them on a pedestal, that's to put their assignment in your life on a pedestal. Because if you don't put it where it belongs, when, you, when, when, it, when it's time to get your head out and get it up, you won't be in position to receive. It could be because they're stubborn, they're prideful. It could be because they're carnal. Carnal has a lot to do with wrong priorities. Um, just not making the main thing the main thing. Um, because I, I believe it was, uh, Pastor Dean said it recently, uh, it might've been nightlife, but, but ultimately when you're, um, you know, doing all you know to do, especially like you have children, um, you know, you, you don't have a lot of time if you're gonna do things the right way for a lot of just nonsense. You know what I mean? You, you really don't. Um, and then the last ones, they're offended. So people have a hard time looking up and accepting truth because they're familiar with those voices. They're, they're stubborn, they're prideful, um, they're carnal, uh, which is just a lack of discipline, wrong priorities, or they are offended. And so ultimately, um, I wrote it this way in, in uh, this morning, this came up in my heart as I was um, praying over this, how people respond to the truth reveals the spirit that they are yielded to. So how people respond to the truth reveals the spirit that they are yielded to. So you kind of know what you're working with when it comes time to look up and get your head out, so to speak. Um, here are some things that, that we, we find ourselves up against. Now, in looking at this, again, knowing what we know about 2 Corinthians, go to 2 Corinthians chapter six in your Bible and we won't have time maybe to really get all of this. Um, but, but we want to get started. This is the message. Companions, as we are in this work with you, we beg you, Paul speaking from a leader's perspective, please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us. So he's saying, please don't disrespect us or not take advantage of all that we're endeavoring to be for you. Don't squander it, don't, don't waste it. Don't waste what's being made available to you. God reminds us, I heard you call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Well, now is the right time to listen, the day to be helped. Don't put it off, don't frustrate God's work by showing up late, by throwing a question mark over everything that we're doing. You know, as a minister, as a leader, you can sometimes even see that, right? When you're telling your children something and you know they're thinking about something else. Like you're not, you're not believing what I'm saying right now. You're not buying what I'm selling. You, you don't have an, you're, you're not open. Well, do we know that if we're not open to the people that God tells us to be open to, that, that means we're not open to him, right? If we're not open to them, we're not open to him. So there's no, well, I'm just gonna have to get this on my own. If you're not getting it from the people that he gave you, you're not gonna get it. You'll get something because there's a lot of voices, seducing voices. The angel's not gonna show up in your, the enemy's not gonna show up in your perspective looking like the enemy. He's gonna present himself as an angel of light. It's gonna be subtle, it's gonna be deceptive. Throwing a question mark over everything we're doing, our work as God's servants gets validated or not in the details. People are watching us as we stay at our post, meaning, meaning the people that are, are following you are watching you, right? And you're watching the people that you're following. People are watching as we stay at our post alertly, unswervingly, in hard times, in tough times, in bad times, when we're beaten up, when we're jailed, when we're mobbed, working hard, working late, working without eating. This is what's required of leaders. This is what's required of you as a parent. Without eating, with a pure heart, clear head, steady hand, in gentleness, holiness, in honest love. When we're telling the truth and when God's showing his power, when we're doing our best, setting things right, when we're praised, when we're blamed, slandered and honored, true to our word, through distrust, ignored by the world, but recognized by God, terrifically alive, though rumored to be dead, beaten within an inch of our lives, but refusing to die, immersed in tears, yet always filled with deep joy, living on handouts, yet enriching many, having nothing, having it all. Dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. Yes. 
Now, in reading that, a lot of those things may not sound appealing to you. But Paul's saying, listen, this is what it's like in the light. This is what it's like in the light. As a leader of light, as, and listen, if you're not committed to the degree, let's say it that way, to the degree you're, su- you're submitted to the light, you're submitted to the word, you're submitted to the spirit of truth, right. right? So let's read that again. What does that look like? That looks like staying at our post. If you say, if you do that one more time, you're gonna get a butt, butt bust in, then they have to get a butt bust in one more time, right? right. Yes. right? If you say, You cannot do this and you change your mind, right? Right? That's not being at your post. That's not being unswervingly in hard times, in tough times, in bad times. You know, your children are watching how you, how you handle the pressure, right? Right? They're watching you. They're watching you. One of the greatest, one of the greatest, and, and I'm words of affirmation so that, you know, I can be bought and I can, and I'm bribed, you know, I'm words of affirmation and gifts. So, you know, I've, as many people will say something then change their mind and say something different. But, but one of the greatest things that, that somebody has said to me recently, and they keep saying it over and over and over. So I think they mean it. I, I think they mean it. But like, I'm so grateful that you don't quit. No matter what, you stay the same. You keep doing what you're supposed to do, no matter what other people do. A variation of that. They they keep saying it. So so I believe I believe him. But but again, this is what it looks like in the light. In hard times, in tough times, in bad times, there's consistency. When we're beaten up, this is what it's like in the light. If you're gonna be in the light, you're gonna face persecution. You're gonna be slandered so to speak. Now in our great nation, we're not jailed, but in, in, in many cases, there's, there's, a, there's an enslavery that happens as it pertains to our emotions, as it, pertains, as it pertains to relationships. We're not as free as maybe other people seem to be, but we've chosen that yes. because we wanna be in the light, yes. right? Mobbed, working hard, working late, right? Working without eating with a pure heart. It's a big one. Clear head, steady hand in gentleness, holiness, and honest love. When we're telling the truth and when God's showing his power, when we're doing our best, setting things right, when we're praised, when we're blamed, slandered and honored, we're true to our word, even though people don't trust us. We're still true to our word. Ignored by the world, meaning they find your life to be completely and totally insignificant. Right? What, who, who even are you? You don't make enough money. You don't have a big enough house. You don't look successful, right? This is what life looks like in the light. This is what it looks like in the light. And Paul's not saying, hey, this is just for us. In verse 11, he says, listen, I long. This is like him, to, him but spiritually fathering and mothering this congregation. He's saying, I long for you to live this same way. I long for you to take such a stand in the light with us. I long for you to do that. So recognized by God, terrifically alive, rumored to be dead, refusing to die, immersed in tears. That's what it looks like in the light. That's what it looks like in the light. Because the reality is as much as you want to empower people and to position truth in front of them in such a way that they will respond, they don't. And you, you're touched by that. You're touched by that, right? So immersed in tears, yet always filled with deep joy. Living on handouts, which means, and Paul was so, so accurate as he would communicate, like, even though I'm worthy of double honor, listen, I'll make myself a slave. I don't want anything from you right? Because I don't want you in any way to have fault or issue with me having nothing, having it all. He said, I can't tell you verse 11, how much I long for you to enter this wide open spacious life. He said, we didn't fit. We didn't fence you in the smallness you feel comes from within you in the living Bible. I like the way verse 12 reads. It says any coldness still between us is not because of any lack of love on my part but because your love is too small and does not reach out and draw me in. What does that mean? You don't want to know the truth. And so we're not, we're not close. We're not close and we can't be close because there's something in you that doesn't want this wide open, spacious life, light in the truth. 
Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. What does he go on to say here, which we pull these verses out of context a lot too. Don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make partnership out of right and wrong? That's not a partnership, that's war. We're in a war. When you tell people to look up, you just woke up hell. You just woke up hell. You just woke up the hell that either they let in knowingly, they let in unknowingly, or they are totally content to keep tolerating. So you're gonna have to stand your ground regardless.